Hello, my name is Renee Nicholson. And as director of the Humanities Center at West Virginia University, I am pleased to welcome you this evening to the second in a series of events celebrating Appalachian writers of color, which was put together by my friend, colleague in the center's writer in residence, Ann Pancake. And tonight we will hear from two truly dynamic scholars on Appalachian writing. But before I, think, I turn everything over to Anne, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. So today's talk is being hosted here on the Zoom webinar platform. And probably at this point, many of you are familiar with Zoom webinar events. Uh, tonight, we're going to invite you to ask questions for today's guests using the Q&A function. And at the end of the presentations, as your host, I'll do my best to ask these questions as time allows. Uh, only answer questions will be made public and the chat function is not enabled for participants. And at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Ann Pancake. Thank you, Renee. Thank you everyone for, for coming tonight. Um, I'm so excited about the presentations we have for you tonight by two scholars of Afro-Latchian Afro literature, Teresa Burris and Amy Alvarez. Both of these critics have far reaching talents they are artists and activists in addition to being scholars and both are deeply committed to championing the diverse literary voices of Appalachia. I wanna thank them for their generosity and being here this evening and deepening our understanding of writing by people of color in our region. It's my honor to introduce first Teresa Burris. You know, as I sat down today to write the introduction, I realized I had no idea where to start because Teresa excels in so many arenas. She has a doctorate in interdisciplinary studies with the Appalachian Studies Women's Studies concentration from Union Institute and University in Cincinnati. A professor at Radford University, she teaches Appalachian literature, multidisciplinary graduate classes in Appalachian studies and for Radford's School of Teacher Education and Leadership. Teresa's literary criticism on Appalachian writers includes chapters in An American Vein, Critical Readings in Appalachian Literature and Appalachia in the Classroom, Teaching the Region, which she co-edited with Patricia Gant. For WVU Press's Appalachian Reckoning, a region response to Hillbilly Elegy, which won the American Book Award for 2020 in the category of criticism, she selected diverse Appalachian poets to contribute to the collection and provided her own photographs and contextual essay. Teresa also publishes in the areas of echo criticism and echo feminism. Just last month, Governor Ralph Northam appointed Teresa to the Virginia Council on Environmental Justice for 2020 2022. She served as lead US organizer for the 2019 Appalachian Carpathian Mountain Conference in Romania, is a steering committee member for Opportunity Southwest Virginia, and is a board member for Appalachian Sustainable Development. She lives on a mountaintop in Southwest Virginia with her husband, her son, and at this point, 12 rescue animals, six cats and six dogs. I've had the privilege of knowing Teresa for over a decade. She is bedrock inspiration to me because no matter what happens, she doesn't stop believing in and giving to Appalachia and its people. We welcome Teresa Burris. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you so much, Ann. That was very, very sweet and, and uh, generous. Um, so I am going to share my um, screen uh, with you all and um, I hope everybody can see that. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to Anne for inviting me um, to participate in this and also to Renee who is spearheading this effort. And I'm thrilled to be presenting tonight with um, Amy Alvarez. And so my role is to um, provide an overview of how Afrolatcha originated. If I can get my slides to board. So I want to start with this, um, this epigraph, actually this um, quote from Adrian Rich is what I began my dissertation with, where language and naming are power Silence is oppression, is violence. So in 1991, the big bang of naming Afrolatcha occurred. 
Um, Frank X. Walker was at uh, University of Kentucky in Lexington, and he was attending a literary event. And what he found out was that initially the event was titled The Best of Appalachian Writing. But because they had four Appalachian Kentucky writers, and then the sole um, writer of color, Nikki Finney, was from uh, the low country of South Carolina, they changed the title to The Best of Southern Writing. Frank knew that there were writers of color in Kentucky and central Appalachia. He went to the dictionary to look up Appalachian and found there that it, it included white residents of the mountainous region. And according to Gurney Norman, who was one of Frank's uh, mentors and one of my mentors, a very, I would say one of the um, fathers of Appalachian studies, the way Gurney describes it, a synapse fired in Frank's brain due to his frustration of not being recognized. And then the word Afrolatcha was born. Um, in 1992 is when he wrote the poem Afrolatcha. So the founding Afrolatchian poets, you've got a part one and a part two, and you can see here um, the uh, writers who were involved um, in, the, in the beginning stages of the Afrolatchian poets. And here are these founding members. Um, one of the most famous stories out of the creation of, of this poets group is um, Frank and Ricardo Nazaro, Nazario y Colon here in the upper uh, right corner would go into the elevator in the Martin Luther King Cultural Center on UK's campus and stop the elevator and read their poems to each other. To, and, and get feedback from each other. And the way that um, Frank and uh, Ricardo talked about it, it wasn't cool or masculine uh, to, to be a poet at that point, or at least in their own minds. Um, Crystal Wilkinson here um, in the left corner, you know, she talks about how um, even going to Eastern Kentucky University as an undergrad, how she didn't quite fit in, how her dreadlocks and country, people couldn't um, put those things together. And so they talk about how this group provided them at, with a writing family, if you will. And they talk about how important here is Nikki Finney, even though she was from the low country, um, she, be, she became a, a professor at UK Lexington and taught a lot of these folks. And um, she even writes about looking at the, the um, foothills of Appalachia. Another quote, and this comes from um, an Appalachian text, Appalachia Inside, Inside Out, which was a sequel actually. And these are the editors who, who have penned this. If self-knowledge is the goal of humanistic learning, literature should reflect some understanding of the self, not only in the abstract, but also on native or familiar ground. So we have this literature that reflects the self. Frank um, first published um, Afrolatcha in 2000. This is actually Gurney Norman and his um, partner, Naoka Hawkins, um, Old Cove Press. Um, they published Afrolatcha. And in the same year, Toby Press published Crystal's first um, short story collection, Blackberries, Blackberries. The next year, um, Frank was involved in helping Fred Johnson and Jean Donahue produce Coal Black Voices, a documentary that I highly recommend. Um, it, it talks that the um, poets talk about the origins of the group, um, how important that naming was for them. 
and they are actually reading their own uh, poems. I do want to acknowledge that Dr. Turner and um, Mr. Cabell's book, Blacks in Appalachia, was the most well-known book prior to the um, birth of Appalachia, if you will. And it's a nonfiction text. And I want to say that um, in chapter one, I'm going to quote from Cavill. As a result of the myths based on Black invisibility in the mountains, scholars and analysts of the region have failed to focus on the existence and plight of Black Appalachians. And then Appalachian Heritage out of Berea uh, College published this special issue in 1991. And Dr. Turner challenges, quote, our admission that we care so much, yet know so little, should energize all of us to complete the story of our Appalachian heritage. I have little doubt in my mind about the riches that would flow to us if more editors and publishers, like those at Appalachian Heritage, would encourage scholars and students of the region, and particularly white scholars and students, to take this largely untrod path. I pose this challenge directly to white scholars, for it is they who keep the gates and comprise the pool of advocates and keepers of the dream of Appalachia's heritage. And so I didn't realize that I was responding to Dr. Turner's challenge um, at the time. And it was thanks to um, some mentors, um, one person in particular, Betsy Brinson on my doctoral committee, but also um, Gurney Norman, who took me under his wing. And even before I finished my dissertation, I published this the, the chapter in um, Gurney and Sharon Hatfield and Danny Miller's rest in peace, um, collection, edited collection in American Vein, Critical Readings in Appalachian Literature. Um, and what I was, I focused on just the th three, because of space, I focused on Frank, Nikki Finney, and Crystal Wilkinson um, in, in this chapter and talked about how their works filled a void. And in my chapter, I do acknowledge um, Nikki Giovanni, who was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, but really identified with and was associated with the Black Arts Movement um, instead of being associated with Appalachia. And I will share that this is, um, I love this picture. It's a picture of my younger son, Campbell, with Nikki after I had interviewed her for um, a, a public library uh, project. And I also think it's important to bring attention to some of the work that was being published in the early 20th century, um, not necessarily literature, but in this case, nonfiction, very imp important and inspiring piece on uh, Memphis, Tennessee Garrison. Effie Waller-Smith, who really, she was the first Afro-Latin poet um, that we know of. She published in the early um, 20th century. She was in the 19 teens. And David Deskins actually republished some of her work, but I did not discover her until Elizabeth Englehart um, talked about her in her her collection, the, the Tangled Roots of Feminism, Environmentalism, and Appalachian Literature, and then in Elizabeth's edited collection where David Deskins talks about Effie Waller-Smith. Also, I think it's important to point out Wilma Dunaway, a scholar at Virginia Tech, sociologist who did incredible primary research. A lot of folks don't think that slavery existed in the mountains, and that is simply not true, and uh, Wilma um, talks about this in her, here again, incredible primary research to, to talk about the 
um, enslaved people in, in the mountains. Um, like Nikki Giovanni, Norman Jordan mostly identified with the Black Arts Movement. And um, he published his collection, Where Do People and Dreams Come From and Other Poems in 2014, the year before he died tragically. I actually had the opportunity to interview Mr. Jordan in 2008. And I wrote an article for Pluck, the Journal of Afro-Latin Arts and Culture. And when I was referencing Stanley Milgram's notion of six degrees of separation, when I interviewed Mr. Jordan last year at the Norton House in Malden, West Virginia, I came within one step of Harlem Renaissance writers, Langston Hughes and Arna Bontemp, reggae superstar Bob Marley, Black arts movement artist Amiri Baraka, Gwendolyn Brooks, Sonia Sanchez, and Haki Matabudi, and finally present day West Virginia hip hop artist 66240. He really, he was a, an incredible man. And you can see how he spanned multiple literary movements with his affiliation with these writers. Later in life, Mr. Jordan did associate with the Afro-Latins and became a member um, in 2008. In addition to the publications that the Afro-Latins were um, sending out into the world, they also were meeting and presenting in different contexts. In Daba Days of Coal Black Voices, which occurred in Northern Kentucky in 2002, was the first time that I actually met um, many of the Afro-Latchans in person. It was right after actually I birthed Campbell, my younger son, and my, my older son, Paul, went with me. The two of us traveled up to participate, in, well, and listen in really um, in this incredibly moving um, event. When Frank was were, uh, teaching at Eastern Kentucky, um, he created this Afro-Latchian guest lecture series and invited me to um, present. This was in 2005. You can see me there with Crystal and Frank. Later in the summer of 2006, I traveled back to Lexington and they gifted me with the honor of being um, an, Afro, an honorary Afro-Latchian. I mentioned Pluck, the Journal of Afro-Latin Arts and Culture. Frank launched this in 2007. It was a result of um, his winning the Land and Literary Foundation Award, a $75,000 award. And he used that money to, well, to spend the time writing on his own work, but then also to launch this very important journal that's still in existence. It's out of uh, UK Lexington now. Also um, at Emory and Henry's Literary Festival, Frank was the featured author in 2009. Um, I, uh, he invited me to uh, read a, my paper and it was actually published in the Iron Mountain Review. It was called New World and Third World Confluence, New Historicist Post-Colonial Poetry of Afro-Latch and Frank X. Walker. I focused on his two York poetry collections. It was about York, the enslaved man who accompanied Lewis and Clark. He was enslaved to Clark on, the, um, on their expedition. In 2017, Crystal was the featured author at Emory and & Henry, and she asked me if I would conduct the public interview, uh, which concludes the, the literary conference there. We have a new generation of Afro-Latchians thanks to the founding members and, and nurturing and inspiring these new young people. Um, several of you I'm sure have heard of these folks. They are, they are accomplished in their own right. Crystal Good, right down um, south of Morgantown in Charleston, West Virginia, her Valley Girl has she, I think she's in the process of creating a, a, um, some kind of film about it. Um, Bianca Spriggs actually was 
um, a co-editor on this collection that came out in 2017, Black Bone, 25 Years of the Appalachian Poets. Um, and I wrote a, a review of that for the Journal of Appalachian Studies. And then just to conclude, um, I think I've still got some time here. I wanted to just highlight real quickly what these folks have done since 1991. Um, Frank is at UK Lexington now. Um, you can see his, and this is not even everything that he has accomplished, but just some of the highlights, and especially, you know, the, the recipient of the 2014 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Poetry, former Kentucky Poet Laureate, the youngest and the first American, um, African American. Crystal Wilkinson, you can see all of her um, accomplishments there. I highly recommend her novel, uh, The Birds of Opulence. It is fabulous. My, my students, when I teach it, love it. Ricardo, um, you can see his accomplish, accomplishments. He's at Western Carolina University currently. Um, I, I've taught of Hiberos and Hillbillies and my students love the, the authenticity, the grittiness of, of his work. Nikki Finney is amazing in so many ways. Um, she was at, you can see it at Kentucky for 23 years, but now she's back in South Carolina, her, her native uh, state. And she's at, at the University of South Carolina, won the Penn American Open Book Award in 96. Um, and then just I'll end with Mitchell Douglas. Uh, he's at Indiana University, um, Purdue University in, in Indianapolis. You can see his awards there. And currently he is serving as poetry editor, editor for Pluck, the Journal of Appalachian Arts and Culture. And that is it for, for me. Let me stop sharing. Oops. Okay, there we go. Was well, going to be great, but you just exceeded my expectations. It was wonderful. Thank you so much, and I, and all the resources you gave us on top of everything else. I just just thank you very very much for 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 doing that for us. You're welcome. And and I'd, I'd like to introduce now Amy. Um, many people on the webinar tonight may already know Amy Alvarez because she's such a presence at WVU contributing to our community by teaching in several subject areas, serving on committees that work for social justice, and as you'll learn tonight, adding Afro-Latin women's writing to the WVU libraries, just to mention a few of the things she does. In addition to all that, Amy is an accomplished writer whose poems have appeared or are forthcoming in Crazy Horse, the Missouri Review, Alaska Quarterly Review, and Prism International to mention just a few. Her work fo focuses on race, ethnicity, gender, regionality, nationality, borderlessness, and systemic injustice, social justice. Amy is both a Contamundo and a Bono Writing Fellow, and most recently she was rewarded the Everly College Racial Justice Grant. Amy is one of those people who comes to Appalachia from outside the region and then jumps in wholeheartedly and gives to the region. Sometimes we're a tricky place to love, and when someone who didn't grow up here feels this place enough to commit to it and contribute to it, I'm always awed and I'm always so grateful. Please welcome Amy Alvarez. Thank you so much, Anne. And I do indeed have a lot of affection for Appalachia, so I'll jump into my presentation here. So. Um, Amy, you're muted. Am I unmuted? Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. I apologize for that. Thank you all so much, Anne. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Renee, thank you for putting this together. And uh, Teresa, thank you for that fantastic um, presentation. So I will just begin here um, with my presentation. Um, I just really wanted to build on 
what Teresa had presented and that's kind of how we went about things um, moving into this. So what I really wanted to look at today is just the importance of Afrolatcha and Afrolatchanness as an identity, a space, a cultural touchstone. Um, and that's really the focus of this presentation. So I wanted to open up with this. It is a map uh, that shows the Appalachian mountain range about 300 million years ago um, when it bordered what is now West Africa. So I believe it's actually in Coal Black Voices in the film that Dr. Burrish just mentioned in her presentation that Nikki Finney brings up this point that Appalachia and, and West Africa were once neighbors. And I think that this is a profound um, concept as we're looking at this idea of Appalachia as a real and imagined space. So there's this shared history, of course, the continents have split. Uh, I love this particular image because it does have West Virginia located right on that map. Um, so as we're thinking about this, that we know that this continents have split, that it's a cruel history, the history of Chattel slavery that brings people from West Africa to the Americas I and mean, to Appalachia, to Appalachia. But it's also, astounding that Afrolatcha is a real place, both historically and geographically, as well as currently through culture, through art. And I think this is a powerful reality. Um, the definition of Afrolatcha on the Afrolatchian poet's site states specifically that Afrolatcha is an ever evolving cultural landscape poised to render the invisible visible. And I think this, this interesting moment in history is, is part of that as well. Um, Appalachian voices are already so marginalized from the broader American culture. Um, so we, we think of this, how much more marginalized are black female, non-binary, LGBTQ+, disabled Afrolatchian voices, um, how much more of those marginalized are pushed aside. So I think that this very concept of Afrolatcha embraces these identities, draws artists and individuals together across this region into this real and imagined space of Afrolatcha, um, that in this definition from Appalachia that does not necessarily include whiteness or rurality, that it can be much broader than that, that that's still deeply connected to the roots of this land, of this place of Appalachia. So I just wanted to give an example of this and kind of dig in a little bit to the qualities of what I see in Appalachian writing and share a couple of poems with you all. So I wanted to just have you all listen to a couple of poems and just consider the identity or identities of the speaker and also identities or, identity, or identities of the poet. Um, of course, we know that in poetry, the speaker is not necessarily the poet, poet's not necessarily the speaker, but I think there's something um, quite interesting and profound about these two pieces. So I'll just read them for you and then we'll talk about authorship in a moment. So you can just kind of relax and sit back. If this were live and in person, I probably would give out a handout, but for right now, you can just relax and listen to these two poems. The first is entitled Rabbit. My father said best to begin small with rabbits, that the shotgun's butt should tuck in my shoulder's palate, and that God's sovereignty must feel like spotting an eye in the thicket. This was granddaddy's farm, not our subdivision's patient lawns. We jumped cottontails from sticker bushes to pair them down to a pound of meat. My father nested me in his body against the recoil that sunk up in my arm. He told me of my great uncle who, depression era, loaned white townspeople venison and preserves. Later stood off the same ones with a gun when they wanted his property. This isn't a story of kindness, he warned. Even rabbits have distress signals at death. To dress them, cut head, body bled, hock joint slit, fur and fist to strip the skin. Our whole winter. My father's position terminated in fiscal rearrangements. He said to be a good hunter, one became the target. My father dashed gun to chest, balanced his breath for a taste of sweet meat. So that's the first of these poems, poems I'll read. And the second is entitled Fusion. As a girl, I made lists, a student of high fashion and only ifs, how to mimic pouty lips and a tousled fresh from bed head guaranteed to put you back in with the man according to Cosmo Mavens. My mom slipped ebony under my bedroom door where I mixed hot wax tricks for instant bare limbs. I wanted to be thin and beyond recognition, to blend in with apple blush cheeks and hair twirling fingertips. The white girls got the science and fit says Ed teacher's looks. Isn't she something? 
I wanted to cry my way out of speeding tickets and into boys' arms. Why wouldn't mom make potatoes and sloppy joes instead of catfish and chitlins? Number one, shave armpits. Number two, relax hair straight. Curl and hitch the cascades in place with still life spray. Mom said it's a sin to get rid of what God gives. You're gorgeous. The shocker was turning hip, the teenage goal. To be unusual, the girls called me unique. I was an exotic garden to walk through. I was not like the other girls they knew. It was a complimentary ticket to get close. Then I received invites for putt-putt and sleepovers. We were the only black family on the block. When we moved in, the neighbors brought bunk cakes and removed their shoes before entering. We were immigrants to neighborhood associations and cul-de-sacs. Yes, we'd have to have them over for dinner. Then my mom shut the door before asking me if they'd like her special, oxtail stew over grits. Only if, only if, a mantra for my curse and a wish. So these two poems, I hope you kind of have some ideas right now about the speakers, the authorship. Um, I'll share that with you right now. So these two poems were written by the same poet. This is Shonda Feldman, who I, I adore. I, I love her work. Um, and I love these two poems because they capture so much of what Afrolatcha is to me. While I know that the speakers obviously could be two very different people of different genders from different times in history, what's phenomenal about Afrolatcha as both real and imagined place is that they do not have to be. That in Afrolatcha, that these speakers can both identify as female and can both be black. And that is a remarkable thing. As you read a poem like Rabbit in the very opening, it sound, our assumptions about, about Appalachia might tell us that it's a white male voice. But again, the construct and the wonder of Appalachia is that it does not have to be, that that same girl can be in those two different places at once. Um, and that's, again, for me, that's what's really kind of powerful about this. Um, I just would say that in all Appalachian work, there are a few qualities that I observe um, and I see those qualities in her work. So one is that the work is experiential, that it pushes the reader to directly engage in the speaker's experience in some way. It's not something that's kind of pretty that you look at from far away. It's something that you deeply engage with and in. The second is this deep interconnectedness to traditional food ways and to family. We see that in both of these pieces, um, this connection to both family and to food ways, um, both very traditional with the hunting of rabbits and then kind of looking at the traditional ways and the ways in which uh, the young woman in fusion, that speaker sort of feels that her family's food ways are not the same as the white folks around her. There's also a connection to the Appalachian landscape, often through the reference to struggle, very apparent in a poem like Rabbit, but I think also apparent in the cul-de-sacs and the putt-putt um, places in, in um, fusion. And then finally, both investigate the circumstances of being a Black person in Appalachia. So I feel that those are sort of the strengths of these pieces. And again, of all really Appalachian work. So here I just wanted to kind of look at this idea of, of course, all these things can kind of apply to Appalachians of any gender. I think it's really important to acknowledge that the outsider perspective of Appalachia is, is as a rural space. Um, and again, for non-Appalachian America, for international, in the international imagination, that this is a space that's dominated um, in their imagination by white people, by straight white men in particular, um, and that this is not true. So I was reading a recent um, essay um, by Leah Hampton. It was published in Guernica just last month, entitled Loss in a Misgendered Appalachia. And I've thought that this was a really important piece of work because she really creates a much more complex picture of the region and really looks at women like Nina Simone, women who've come out of, of Appalachia, Nina Simone in particular, out of the Western Hills of North Carolina. Um, and I think that to perceive Appalachia as a primarily a white space, as it's actually defined, as Frank X. Walker found out in the dictionary, um, that it's reductive, that it marginalizes great artists before they can even recognize their greatness. So in this quote, of course, she says here that Americans have always used rural spaces to validate and perpetuate toxic masculinity, to erase people of color, and to justify destroying ecosystems. We are a nation of land breakers and we associate land and morality with penetrative acts. Forgotten in all this is the Appalachia that gave us Nina Simone, that every aspect of American morality leans heavily toward the feminine, 
who are the feminine, the non-binary, and the other. One thing I was just thinking about I didn't include here was that she says that all the roads in the Appalachian Mountains, all the roads in the Blue Ridge Mountains where she lives have curves. So really identifying Appalachia with the feminine here. Um, I also think of Marion Wright Edelman who said, we cannot be what we cannot see. Um, I feel that representation is really essential for upcoming generations of young black Appalachian artists, especially young women. Um, and I want to hear and read that work as it, as it arrives, but of course to be it, it has to be available to those young folks. So this is what brought me to devise this research project, which Anne had mentioned, to increase the visibility of Appalachian women and non-binary writers here at WVU. So the service project um, was to create an Afro-Latin writers database and also to expand our library's holdings. So this is funded through the Row Excellence um, Through Equity Award from West Virginia University's Women and Gender Studies Department. And my goals were really focusing on Afro-Latin women and non-binary writers and adding in those texts to West Virginia University's library and also creating a database of Afro-Latin and Black Appalachian writers. Um, I was at the time running a lot of workshops for West Virginia teachers and I was finding that I couldn't always find great representation when it came to um, Afro-Latin women's voices, especially younger, more contemporary voices, that kind of second generation um, that uh, Dr. Burris was just talking about. So I worked with my graduate research assistant, Kalo Sokoto, and also with Dr. Lynn Stahl, who is our humanities librarian here at WVU, and we did some work, which I'll kind of share a bit about with you. So the first was to really expand WVU's library holdings. And these were some of the texts that we added in, including Shonda's work here. Um, but they were voices that I felt were essential that were missing. And in addition to works by, again, I was focusing primarily on Afro-Latin women, but I also found that there were LGBTQ writers that we needed, um, important trans Appalachian voices that were missing. And so really in the spirit of inclusiveness, it was about looking at what are the voices that young people need to hear here and now in Appalachia in order to see who they could potentially be as writers, as creators, as artists. And so that, those are some of the pieces that I was really looking to include alongside, again, with my primary focus being Afro-Latin women writers. Um, the next piece of this, of course, was a database, um, which was delayed because of COVID. Um, there were some really wonderful undergraduate research assistants and young women who were working on this, and this was delayed, of course, due to COVID. But here's a draft page that Dr. Lynn Stahl and I made sure that folks could see um, tonight. So this was a page that we're kind of still working on. It's for Jackie Shelton Green, who was the first African-American poet laureate of the state of North Carolina. So um, I just wanted to kind of move to in closing just to kind of talk about the concept of Afrolatcha as necessity. Um, I feel that Afrolatcha and a Black Apple, Appalachian identity are really critical. Um, and that it's important that people who do not live in this region understand that there's a long history of Black people in this region, of Black artists who've made the hollers their home. And it's also important to think about the idea of rurality, that rural does not mean white and male, um, and that these hills have really birthed these coal Black voices, um, these folks that can sing soprano on, on Sunday in a church, bring down a buck on a Saturday. Um, I'm a New Yorker, that's where I'm from originally, but I married someone who's from Appalachia, and I've made my home in this place as a Black woman, as a Black poet. Um, and I feel that's important that I listen to the many voices of this region. And it's especially important to me that I listen to and that others hear the voices of people of African ancestry from this place. Um, and I just want to end with this idea of as long as we can listen to and celebrate the voices of the hills and hollers themselves and to all those who reside in them, ultimately I feel that, that we're creating the Appalachia that we all want to see. And again, celebrating this idea, this place, um, this real and imagined place of Appalachia um, itself. Um, so I'm just gonna stop here and give it back over to Renee and Anne. Thank you so much, both uh, Amy and Teresa. That was uh, fantastic. And um, I'm very excited because for the first time ever hosting an event, I already have things in the q and I usually, I have to uh, think of some snappy questions to ask and I have some, but um, so I'm going to try to uh, read these and get people's names right. If I pronounce your name wrong, please um, accept my apology. I'm going to do my best. So this is from um, uh, Mandy Wyrich. 
I hope I said your last name right. Um, and she is uh, letting us know uh, that Nkeshi Elamin and uh, Angela Davis have started a new podcast called Black in Appalachia. It started just a few months ago, and it is really good. So um, thank you for that. Um, I think that's it's always great when we get together in these spaces and can share things. So um and then I have uh, a question here from uh, Suzanne Strick, Strike. I hope I said that right. Um, this is for Amy. She says, how have Afro-Latin poets and writers changed you as a writer? And she wants to know if you are relating to the land more than before. It's a really great question. I would say absolutely yes. Um, the three poems that I just published in Crazy Horse were all Appalachia related. They were all about this space. Um, there's a poem that, uh, yeah, a lot of the work I've written recently has actually been much more connected to the land that I found that since I've lived here, I've been thinking a lot more about, about land and about what grows on land. Um, I've always kind of been somewhat aware. <laughs> um, I, I've always kind of had a love for biology and for ecology, but I feel like at this point, I want to be more deeply aware of what's around me. I, I'm forced to be just being outside in Appalachia, um, like, you know, a few minutes away from my house, I'm in a hemlock forest. So it's it's just to be hyper aware of the land that you're on, uh, what's, what's transpired on that land. And I think that there's a real power here. I was, um, I'll write about this at some point, but I was sitting out and I was reading, um, a really fantastic book called Braiding Sweetgrass um, by a wonderful Native American scholar. And I was sitting outside on the river here on the Monongahela and I saw a long nose gar, a, a fish that's existed probably since about 300 million years ago when, when Appalachia and, and the West Coast of Africa were seated right next to each other. And just knowing that there's this ancient, ancient history in this place, this, this ancient fish, these ancient hills, um, it, it can't help but have a profound effect on me, I think, as a writer. Um, yeah, so it's definitely something that I've noticed. Thanks, that's a great answer. And also, um, kudos on knowing the name of that fish. I'm always looking at things and I'm like, I wish I had learned the name. I, I need to have a friend who's an ichthyologist. I think I said that right, people who study fish. Uh, we have another question in. Oh, we're getting questions right and left. I love this. Um, this is from Laura Farina, who is a, a longtime professor in the Department of English. Um, she says, great project, Amy. And her question is, have you thought about ways to get information about Afrolatian texts to the public libraries? And she, she follows that up, like maybe through the digital interface you're working on. So that's such a great question, Lara. Um, it's actually a conversation I was having with, um, with Carlos Sokoto, who is currently a PhD student here at WVU and just a fantastic all around scholar. Um, so part of our conversation was thinking about a digital text and how can we get digital text, not only to public libraries, but also into spaces um, like, you know, places where Kahlo is from Kenya. So we're talking about um, how is it possible to kind of get text into places where there weren't texts before through digital libraries. So that's kind of an expansion of the project, um, but that's certainly something we've given some thought to and certainly a conversation that I'll continue to have with um, Lynn Stahl, um, the WVU library. It's a great question. So ironic that you brought up Lynn Stahl, who is a fa fantastic humanities librarian, because the next question is from Lynn. Um, this is great. So um, she says, the question of nomenclature is really interesting with regard not just to author self-identification, but also thinking about readers trying to find these texts. Do you uh, do any of you know whether there have been attempts to get Afrolatin, um, and that's in in quotes, established as a Library of Con Congress subject heading, like for example the Agrarians or the Black Mountain Poets, so they would be cataloged as Afrolatin in libraries? Is that something that would be desirable, or is it preferable for the term to remain sort of fluid and not officially sanctioned? My understanding is that 
it has been adopted by the Library of Congress. Um, and I, and I want to say that I heard that from Frank. Um, and Lynn, I would need to, to verify that. I would need to do some research. But I, somewhere in my middle-aged brain, I think, I think that, that, that that has been established. Now, there is, to your point about the, the fluidity of the, of the term, there, um, in fact, I will say that uh, Dr. Turner, I mentioned uh, Blacks in Appalachia, he and some other folks are working right now on issuing, he, he um, kind of tongue in cheek calls it Blacks in Appalachia Redux, um, but they're, they're issuing a new volume of Blacks in Appalachia. And there's some tension there, and, and he's published on this, about Afrolachia as brand. Um, so, you know, debates and people, you know, people of color in, in the mountainous region claiming different titles. Um, but to, to your question, I think that, that it, it is in the Library of Congress. And here again, I'd have to do some research. I just wanted to say one, one quick thing on that, um, which is kind of come to Teresa's point that there is some tension. Um, Nikki Giovanni, for example, she considers herself a black Appalachian. So there's certainly a, I think a generational divide in some ways in terms of the language that folks will use. But um, yeah, that, that's kind of all I had to add there. Great. And I'm sure there are gonna be some more questions coming in. So I'll ask a, a question of my own while others come in. Um, and I, I wanted to go back to something that Teresa said, but I'm, I'm hoping both Teresa and Amy will both uh, weigh in on this because um, there was something interesting that Teresa brought up in the you know early establishment of the uh, Afro-Latin poets and the sort of, I, I don't even know exactly the right word, but sort of the, the uh, you know, the charge for white scholars to get involved and to champion these voices and to do that work of, of putting the, this Afro-Latin literature out to talk about it and to, to create space with it. And it resonated when Amy was also talking about, and she had a beautiful quote about the invisible becoming visible. And so, um, you know, we are at a predominantly white university at WVU. Um, and we are uh, the only state that it, we're the land grant university of the only state wholly in Appalachia. And so I, I was hoping maybe we could talk, I guess this is more of a talking point than a question, but we could talk a little bit about the, the roles of white scholars and how we open up spaces uh, for diverse voices in the region. You know, Renee, the, the first thing that came to mind when you were talking is for women to get the vote, it was, de it was dependent on men. <laughs> and so because we live in um, a society built on white supremacy, um, you know, I understand Dr. Turner's charge on and especially if you look at the history of Appalachian studies and the myth, you know, the, the white myth, um, the whitewashing of Appalachia that goes back to the missionaries coming into the region at, in, during reconstruction because it, it was not as messy, if you will, as the deep south and they could sell it better to their benefactors back in the northeast. Also, the local color writers, you know, that, that, that was part of the whitewashing. So it's, uh, you know, it goes back to allyship, I think. Um, and, you know, at, at coming from a feminist perspective, when, when I was writing my dissertation as a white woman, focusing on the Afro-Latchians, I felt it was important, you know, to acknowledge I can never know what that experience is, but empathy 
can allow me to enter that space and honor their voices. Thanks for that, Teresa. That's helpful. I, Amy, I didn't know if you wanted to add to that or not. Um. I think Teresa gave a great response to that. Um, I guess the only thing I would say, I guess, as a Black professor at a primarily white institution, um, I think a lot about the texts that I teach in my classes. Um, for, I just taught a creative writing workshop with, I only had white students in that class. And um, I had very intentionally, not knowing who's going to be in front of me, made my, um, my readings quite diverse and focused on primarily women and primarily women of color. Um, and that was, that was sort of what I focused on. It was really interesting at the end of the semester, I was kind of wondering what students thought about that. And there was excitement around that, that there were voices that they felt they wouldn't otherwise be exposed to, that they may not otherwise have sought out for themselves, that they're now completely fascinated with. So I think that there's something we said too, as educators, first really think about what are the texts that we're placing in our classes? And is it possible that those are texts that you think, this is the only text that, that I can teach this concept with? Perhaps there's another out there that's written by a person of color, that's written by a woman of color that you can actually put in place of that text that you imagine is the only way that you can teach that idea. Um, so I think looking for that scholarship, looking for those scholarly essays and looking for that creative work as well, is quite important. That's such an excellent point, Amy. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so we have another question that's come in. Um, this is uh, for Teresa. And uh, the question is, when you were growing up in Appalachia, were you aware of the region's unique qualities or did leaving to go to college make you more aware of its specialness? And was this the same for the African-American culture in Appalachia? I'm gonna tell on myself here. Um, <laughs> I, so I grew up in Bristol, Tennessee, Northeast Tennessee, and I thought that life was going on elsewhere. Uh, and so I did my undergraduate work at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And I thought, I am out of here. I will never come back. I'm going to live the big city life, maybe not in Atlanta. And I ended up going to DC for a couple of years. It did take me, and I know that my story is not unique because I have, I have talked to others. I've read other stories about this. I had to leave to appreciate what was here. And it wasn't until my master's degree in English at Radford University and Dr. Grace Tony Edwards, who was my predecessor and a mentor, I was taking a class with her and I realized this, what she was teaching, this is the stuff of my life. I didn't realize that this was worthy of scholarship. Um, and I, you know, I even tell on myself when I'm doing presentations to different groups, you know, I, I got made fun of at Emory because of my accent. So I learned to code switch. So I, you know, I was from the uncultured part of the state. Yeah, I, I had to go away um, to appreciate. And, and I, you know, in terms of my awareness, unlike some people in Appalachia, I was very fortunate in that my, one of my first um, idols, I will say, was my kindergarten teacher. This was in the early 70s, was Ms. Dawson. Interestingly, at Washington and Lee Elementary School in Bristol, Virginia, African-American woman. That, that, I think, really, she, she profoundly affected me and my outlook on, on people of color. Thank you for that, Teresa. That was great. Um, 
you know, I think that, that, you know, when we talk about Appalachia and, and Anne even um, kind of mentioned this in, in her introduction of Amy, is the ways that we come to be Appalachians. Um, you know, Teresa, you, you're of the region, you leave and come back. Amy, you come and you make your home here. I know um, for myself, I have deep, deep roots um, in uh, the, the Western part of West Virginia, um, but I grew up elsewhere. That's where my extended family was. And that always felt like home in a lot of ways. I moved around a lot as a young person and even as an adult, but now I have lived the longest in West Virginia. So it's um, a very interesting thing to take on, um, you know, your Appalachian uh, journey for lack of a better way of putting it. And, you know, I, I can't help but wonder how um, that changes or is, um, you know, the nuances are different when you're a person of color. Um, so, you know, if we maybe want to talk a little bit about that, Amy, I, I think it's um, amazing that you have come to this place and connected so profoundly. I mean, everybody who's around you sees it, feels it, knows it. Anybody who just watched your presentation sees it, feels it, knows it. So um, I think this is a rich discussion. So I'm going to prod it a little bit here and also do the thing where you say, okay, this is the last call for questions. Any last questions, please get them in. Um, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Sure, I, I will say that coming to Appalachia, I had my own perceptions of what the place was. And one of the things that made me feel more comfortable coming here, honestly, was knowing about the Appalachian poets. But that was, that I was already reading, I loved Frank X. Walker's work before I came to Appalachia. I'd already read the work that Andres had mentioned, um, looking at your work. Um, I, I was so profoundly impacted by that work. Um, I had read and taught Kelly Norman Ellis um, when I taught high school in, in Boston. Um, so I, I came here with a knowledge of that work already, but I also came here with my own assumptions about Appalachia and about whiteness and ruralness um, and maleness. And I had lots of assumptions about this place that I quickly learned were wrong. Um, and I kind of made it my job, I think, to try to start having those conversations with writers. I will say, I won't name names, but I was at AWP and I, was, I met this really important, really fantastic um, black writer. And in conversation, I mentioned that I worked at West Virginia University and lived in West Virginia. And she was like, oh my God, are you okay? That was the response that I received. So it was, it's been really interesting having conversations with folks within the writing community about being black in Appalachia and, and kind of being like, well, okay, look, I understand that perception. And I won't say that everything has been like a crystal stare, you know, um, to quote likes and hues, but I will say that it has been much different than I expected. And that the moments at which I'm able to engage with other people of color in Appalachia, those moments feel, feel I, I guess like, again, kind of to go back to what Teresa said, it kind of highlights the importance of that for me. So when I was at Furious Flower, able to connect with Nikki Giovanni and with all of these um, other black scholars and poets, there was something really magical that happened there that maybe I wouldn't have been as attentive to or as deeply connected with because I guess, and I, I can't remember the, the artist, um, I think it's Glenn, I can't remember his last name, um, but uh, he has this wonderful piece that says, I feel most black when I am thrown up against a sharp white background. And that's what I've been thinking a lot about since I've come to Appalachia and and, just, I, and looking at the Appalachians, I feel that I, I already was pretty aware of who I was before coming here, but that I feel like it's kind of made me reconsider aspects of myself, um, the ways in which I, I relate to place, as, as I mentioned before, and um, and to celebrate parts of myself that maybe I didn't know were worth celebrating. Um, so I think that there's definitely a, a profundity, I think, to coming to this place and and seeking to, to understand and seeking to, to have other folks understand it through a new lens. Um, and I don't know, I, I always get excited when I talk about West Virginia and about the future of Appalachia because I feel that there is there's a moment and a renaissance happening here. And I talk about it with a lot of folks here much of the time, but I feel like there's a, an Appalachian awakening and I'm just so glad to be here at this moment 
and, and to watch it happen. Um, I mean, it's hearing the, the amazing young voices the other week that you all had, uh, those three fantastic writers, um, young black um, Appalachians, Appalachians, that was phenomenal. And those are voices, again, that I want to hear and that I think others need to hear um, because the only way that young black folks are gonna stay here in Appalachia, we won't have that brain drain, is if they can hear those voices and know that there's a place for them um, and that they can shape and create this place into what it needs to become. Yeah, fantastic answer, Amy, as always. And I agree, um, there was one of the, the last event when we were listening to the emerging writers um, was one of the most hopeful things um, and truly, um, uh, inspiring. Uh, Teresa and Anne, if, if you wanted to weigh in on that um, before I go to uh, the last question and uh, wrap up, please do. I'll give you a minute here to decide or not. <laughs> Okay. Um, and then we do have one last question. Um, and um, this is from uh, Vahid Arafi, and I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, uh, he said, the, the, thank you, Amy, for your remarkable presentation. It was so greatly appreciated. I am curious if during your research, you encountered stories writing from writers of color on the history of movement migration, ingenuity, and immigration in Appalachia. Hi, Vahid. Um, I, I think that Frank X. Walker's um, Buffalo Dance, The Journey of York, for, for me, I guess that's always the first thing I kind of come to um, because it is about indigeneity. It's about uh, York uh, as a black man, his relationship to the native people, uh, to Sacagawea, and this kind of, again, this kind of imagined uh, retelling of history that is just so fantastic. Um, those are the kind of the first things that come to me. Um, I might have to do a bit more research to kind of think beyond that. That's such a good question. Um, there, there is a poet who I'm thinking of right, right now who is Oh gosh, if I could just remember all the names right now, who is Turkish actually, um, uh, that's part of her background. I think she's Turkish and also Latinx, um, but she's, she's in Appalachia and has grown up here and she kind of writes about that identity in her work. Um, I'm so sorry, I can't remember names right now, end of the semester brain drain, but Vahid, you can know you can always email me. <laughs> I'm happy to, to try to get that name to you. <laughs> I would also mention the Eastern Kentucky Social Club, um, which is about the the miners, the uh, miners of color in Eastern Kentucky and their descendants, and how they have. It's it's not um, literature per se, but it is about out migration, um, just a different uh, perspective. Thank you for that. And, you know, I was thinking about um, a wonderful poet slash third year medical student, Sarah Berzinji, um, who writes beautiful poems from, from the region and ties them to her family uh, in, uh, that live in the Kurdish region of Iraq. So um, there's some really interesting um, things that, that have to do uh, with, with uh, you know, how we come to be here and how we connect different places. So um, this has been just a fascinating discussion. I, I really um, want to thank everyone, um, Teresa, Amy, and Ian, um, you know, if you have any last comments or if you want to just turn your um, videos on a second before we, we break for the evening, I, I'd just like to uh, thank you all. Um, for this and for this evening and, for, and just for the great discussion. Any last things? Um, I'll just give you a moment. Well, I, I just want to thank again, Amy and Teresa so much. This was just inspiring and and, and so informative and you guys are, are fantastic and thank you. And Renee, thank you for everything you did to 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 make this happen, to bring it together and your 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 great, excellent talent at at uh, at, at taking the questions and
All right. Well, on behalf of the Humanity Center, um, just like to thank everyone again, um, and all of you who uh, came out tonight for attending. Um, and we definitely hope you will join us in the new year. It is almost a new year. It's exciting. And specifically on January 13th, 2021 at 7 p.m. Uh, for an engaging reading by the novelist Annette Clapsaddle. Uh, we're very excited to, to ha host her uh, here, but on Zoom here. Um, and you can register using the link on our homepage at humanitycenter.wvu.edu. Thanks again. Stay safe. Happy holidays. And we hope to see you soon.